And welcome to One More Thing Podcast. This morning, I'm joined with Dr. Larry Bacham. Good morning. Good morning. Week three of Becoming More. I mentioned in staff meeting that um, when you sent out the, the email for this, this new eight-week series, I was kind of like, okay, where, I wonder where he's going with it. Because it's a very vague title, and you fill in that that sort of ambiguity with those principles and truths from scripture. And man, it's been a really, really, for me personally, and for a lot of people that I have conversations with, a very impactful and practical series on those things that we can do from, you know, learning from the life of Moses. And this week was the burning bush experience, a very, very famous story of, of Moses's life. And I want to kind of set it up the questioning to you, because uh, I have some questions that that hopefully that obviously relate to the sermon, but also to people's lives and how they can have and not miss their their burning bush moment. There's a I love zombie movies. I think they're very philosophical and what what they stand for. They're not just horror movies. And there's this one in particular that I saw that it's my favorite of all time. It's called World War Z, and this outbreak happens and people are transforming into these flesh eating monsters or whatever and Brad Pitt's in it. And he's a scientist and he's in the middle of this chaotic situation where the world is just turned on its head and he's running to get himself out of harm's way. And there's a lot of adversity like you talked about Sunday. But he starts to begin to stop in the middle of the chaos and noticed burn, what I would call burning bush incidents. He notices that the zombies aren't attacking everyone, that they're leaving people who are sick alone, people who have cancer or certain diseases, like they're not interested in those people, they're only the healthy people. And he registers it in his mind and he uses it later on in his life uh, and studies and research to, to find out how, as a first step in eradicating this disease. And in Moses' time, a burning bush would not have been an uncommon event. Like he, I'm sure in that desert heat, bushes would burn all the time due to the heat or whatever. But he stops and he notices the peculiarity of the situation. Like, Wait, this bush is on fire. I've seen that before, but it's not consumed. In the same way Brad Pitt notices, wait, the zombies aren't attacking everyone. What do you believe that because of the busyness of our life and the chaos of our life, that sometimes we may miss burning bush moments because we're not stopping and listening and looking for the spirit of God within us to speak to us. Like, what do you, what do you think about that analogy? Well, first of all, I think the next series that we do should be called zombies. (laughs) (laughs) It's a four week sermon on a series on zombies. There we go. What does that mean? (laughs) And we have to go back to the the Bible to try to find these uh, stories. There's a few of them in there that, you know, the the dead were walking around type thing. That's right. You could make it work. But I think that, uh, I think it's absolutely true that there are so many things around us that could trigger us into a spiritual growth process, but we're too busy, mm-hmm. and I think we miss it. I mean, you get up in the morning, and you—I just use nature as an example. You get up in the morning, you you got to get ready. You, you know, get you what? Maybe you slept five minutes too long. You're rushing. You get in the car and you drive off. Da da da, and you you don't pay attention to the sun rise as it came up. Yeah. Or maybe you didn't notice the blue skies or the fact a couple of days this week, you know, the, the temperature was lower. Mm-hmm. And one day it was in the sixties and I, I was walking in the morning and just like this is wonderful. But if I hadn't been walking in the morning, I may have missed it. So I think we put ourselves in position. I think sometimes we have to intentionally put ourselves in a position to be aware. Yeah. And if we're uh if we're emotional about everything that happens, I don't see how we can learn when we're when we're screaming in a panic or we're walking like the, the living dead zombies, yep. you know, they're not paying attention to anything. So it seems, and we miss it. So, and I, I think the real question for me would be, what can I do to strategically put myself in a place where I really can uh, experience those burning bush moments? And mm-hmm. I, I don't know the answer to that for everyone, right? but for me, it's slow down, time of reflection, maybe a walk in the morning, maybe a quiet time in the morning. Um, just pause without the media. Yeah. I mean, I get up in the morning and I'm guilty of checking my email. I mean, like in the first couple minutes, what happened in the mm-hmm. night that I missed? Did anybody send me something in the night? And sometimes I, I challenge myself to, hey, first thing we're going to do is not do that. Yeah. We're going to do some other things, you know, get up and take a few moments of reflection and get your life in, in order. That's awesome. I mean, we are creatures of habit. 
You know, we we like our routines. Creatures again, good word. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do this experiment with my philosophy students um, when I was a professor. I challenge them when they're, you know, and to document it, to journal it. And I, you know, it was extra points or whatever. And I said, when you find yourself driving and you're noticing like a row of trees or maybe a beautiful sky, I said, change the music in your car. Mm -hmm. Like, look at the sky, listen to Metallica. Mm -hmm. And how does, what, what resonates, like what feelings do you have? Then listen to like maybe Beethoven's Fifth mm -hmm. or Bach or something else. Or even if you're into religious music, worship music. And that was always like one of my favorite assignments to give because they'd come back and they'd have these moments of like, when I turned on Hans Liszt, it was on 90.9, 90, 90 which was the classical station in Dallas. And it was Hans Liszt playing. It just, to them, they said, it seemed as though the trees got greener and the sky got bluer mm. and the clouds were more fluffy. And that was the, the most common response was, I stopped, I slowed down, I changed the environment, the ethos, the atmosphere. And it's almost as though the world became more vivid mm. to me. And I think that was a moment for me in your sermon when you when you talked about Moses, take your shoes off, like change the environment, be grounded in this this space that you're in. Because there was that, you know, wearing your sandals keeps you, prevents you from touching mm -hmm. the holiness of the ground. What do you think are some things other than busyness that prevent us from touching the holy in our life? Because one of the things in your sermon that really resonated was the idea that sometimes touching the holy or becoming more like Christ doesn't mean like we're touching just holy ground, but we're going to have to touch elements of adversity in our life to get there. Like it's almost guaranteed to become more. It's not just about doing more or experiencing more, but there's going to be more of other things that maybe we're not real excited or happy about. No, I think it good advice. And you know, my friend says, "Here, take my advice. I'm not using it." So, yeah. <laughs> uh, good advice to be in the midst of a crisis. If you can say, "Hey, I know this is not going to be forever," mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm going to look for the positives that come out of this. I've had people that have gone to jail and come back to church and say, "Wow, that was really good for my life." Yeah, because they're 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 made to be quiet, or people have been in the hospital for extended. They come back and they say, I had nothing to do. I was forced to slow down. And in that mm, slowdown, yeah. all something good came out of that. And in the adversity, the the things that really, you know, the flat tires, the, the you know, the circumstances of our life, illness, relationships, whatever, if we can slow down and say, okay, what can I learn from this or despite this? This did not happen to teach me a lesson. This happened because this is what life is. Mm -hmm. Life is not, you know, smooth sailing. There's always a storm that's going to come up. But when you do, the, when you have it, what can you learn from it? And how can that ground you even greater for times ahead? Yeah. Um, Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book Outliers. That's right. And, you know, the whole concept there was people who really were facing adversity. The guy that invented chemotherapy. The fact that he had gone through all kinds of abuse from the medical community, but he refused to let these kids who were dying from different types of cancer, he kept trying these different medicines in a cocktail, mixing mm -hmm. them together. And, and eventually it started working. But it said the reason he was able to do that and fight off all the adversity of the medical world is because he grew up in a in a dysfunctional family where her mother, his mother mm. remarried and her husband was abusive to him and he was used to putting up with all the crap. Yeah. So when he got here, he was like, ah, same stuff, just a different day. Yeah, and he was able to uh, to learn from those difficulties to provide greater good for humanity, and those are the stories I love to tell because yeah. I think they're they're important. And here's Moses, and from a science point of view, let me give you my scientific analysis. Yeah. Take my religious hat off. <laughs> I go, you know, in that area, sometimes there are, uh, maybe there's um, cracks in the Earth's surface. Maybe there was some methane gas or something that came out or right. something. Yeah. I mean, at the Oracle of Delphi, which I was just at recently at, over near Greece, and they said the Oracle, there was a, a crack in the surface of the earth. And some of the gases that came out that she would, you know, she'd be in the area where these would make her have kind of a, a trip. Right. Like hallucinogenic a, experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. hallucinogenic experiences, believe it or not, 
endemic to humanity often find a spiritual side. That's absolutely right. It's because you're going into yourself, you're going into your mind, you're going into your heart, you're going into God within you. And I think some of the stuff that comes out of that is very positive. So That's it's right. not just like, oh, you know, he's a druggie. Yeah. No, I think there's so many good things that can come out of that kind of thing. So I don't know, maybe that same type of thing, maybe some gas caught fire. And that's why, you know, that bush was just a wick like oil beneath it. It's, it was burning, but not consumed. That's right. And there were really ones you know was not consumed. Yes. So something was happening there. And Moses, you know, there's this guy comes up and he sees that. But what it's hard to explain and uh, is take your shoes off. Yeah. Because I will tell you, sometimes uh, in hindsight, when the story's been told, because there was no narrator there. That's right. There was no... Uh, observer that's, that's writing right. down these stories. These are stories that were told about Moses over the years. Take your shoes off because in that moment, there was such a God experience for him that it changed the trajectory of his life yep. forever. Yes. And there's some, some things that have happened to you yep. that coming to Suncoast has changed the, tra the trajectory of your life Absolutely. forever. That's right. And, uh, or when you met, you know, your wife, I mean, yeah. come on, it changed the trajectory of her life and your life. That's right. And Esther, you know, that, that's just a wonderful thing. But, and when I met Becky or where I was, and I'd use a story, I was in Tennessee and I wanted to stay. Yep. But if I hadn't have moved to Florida, my whole world would have gone a different direction. Yeah. And I don't know, but I would not have had the three kids I had. Probably yep. wouldn't have married her, Becky. That's right. I mean, and now you look back and say, I'm so glad because I like where I am today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I don't know that I want to go through the pain of, uh, you know, quitting a career and going into sales and coming back and struggling to start something and really taking huge risk and huge steps. But I look back and I really see the hand of God. Yeah moving me through life and I give him credit and I will tell you I have felt his voice in my heart directing me to do certain things and yeah. I've tried to be responsive to that and I look back and say you know that's God at work and I think he still is and I think we'll miss it if we don't take a moment to pause and listen or at least to pause and reflect mm -hmm. on this circumstance or to say you know not everything in my life is perfect and in my life not everything in my life has been perfect. Yeah, There's been stressors all along the way. But, you know, you get up in the morning, I'm positive. What can happen? Everything works out, it seems. And I have people look at me and say, you are so lucky. And I go, you know, it's it's not really about being lucky. No. It's just about, am I fortunate? Yes. Am I blessed? Yes. Have I been sensitive to try to make good decisions based on the best information? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think people are going through cancer and heartache and divorce and they're broken and they're wounded and maybe today they need to hear these words you know take a deep breath where you are mm -hmm. and tomorrow's going to be different and your life can have a very good positive outcome but just see how that this negative can become a positive in your life yeah and it can be if you allow it that's amazing and we forget that because we want to get i think it's our our propensity our nature to get out of that adversity as quickly as possible to get rid of that pain and just to return to a sense of normalcy. Um, I know for me, you know, going through a divorce and I was talking to a guy in, in Brett's class and he mentioned like he's, he just broke up with a woman and you know, he's feeling the pain of that loss or whatever. And he's like, you know, I know time, time heals all wounds. And I'm like, well, time is part of it, but I think it's, this I think it's being loved again is what is going to heal, mm -hmm. and that is what takes time. Mm -hmm. But now you're in the midst of this pain, and you want to relieve it. And what we usually do is jump into like inauthentic love because we want that feeling again, and it just hasn't been enough time for us to to heal ourselves and to go through the, the the becoming more of who we need to be. Agree. And so the last question I have is Moses upon this this sort of call from God and this sort of givenness of his, his mission makes a bunch of excuses of his inabilities and his insignificances for you as our pastor, when you felt that call, what, what sort of things did you face excuses you were make making about, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. Did, the, did any of those thoughts? Come oh, to absolutely. Lots of different thoughts, you know, um, 
where do you go? How are you going to do it? How can you afford it? Are you sure this is right? Mm-hmm. Well, and uh, but once I centered my heart on this is the right thing to do, and and the real benefit that I had that some people do not have, I had a wife who believed in me strongly, mm-hmm. and she said, "I'm with you. You know, you follow your heart." And and I have, and she's been not just with me. She's been a person that's that's been part of the. The process, I mean, she's run all the children's ministry. My kids are all musicians. They all stepped up and were on stage. Yeah. I mean, Laura was on stage when she was a teenager. She went to college. Stacy stepped up. A couple of years later, she went to college. Ryan stepped up. Yep. And, you know, my kids have been involved in, in that. So preaching, music, and children, you've got a lot of it covered. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but that's part of, the, part of the process. But was it easy? And I, I, here's what's scary. I never really had a plan B. Yeah. Plan A was this is what we're going to do. What's plan B if it doesn't work? I, I just never thought of a plan B. <laughs> and sometimes good business, I'd say, what's your contingency plan? I That's mean, right. I asked that question, but for me, I had none. <laughs> I put all my eggs in that basket, and I'm so glad I did. And and I tell you this, God is so faithful, yeah. and I think his presence in my life has helped me to make good decisions most of the time. One of the good decisions, I said, That's because I was listening to God. When I make a bad decision, it's because, well, maybe— I just wasn't paying attention. Yeah. and uh, But most of the time, you know, leaders make good decisions 95% of the time. Yeah. Never, no way is 100%, and I'm not either. But I, I I am so grateful to be where we are despite yeah. good decisions. Maybe not, I could have made better decisions. But I, I think that we are in a great community. We're in a great place. And I want to I want to be one that leads by example. Mm-hmm. I am still becoming more. Yeah, Christ is still working in me. And I, you know, it's not finished. I'm in process like we all are, but, uh, but I am trying to be a Christ follower and love people. And I think that's what makes the difference. That's it's making the difference. And it's, it's a wonderful community here to be a part of. And I love how you finish that off that Becky and your family, they, they weren't just with it. They were in it. That's right. And that's our theology here. God is not just with you. That's right. God is in you. I and couldn't say it better. That's, that's awesome. the, that's, that's the difference of Suncoast, man. I agree. Thanks for being here, Dr. Bauckham. My pleasure.